Hello, and welcome to It's Not Over with Dr. Dan Farrell. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back and uh, on this uh, wonderful day here. Hopefully you'll stay tuned for the next 14 or 15 minutes, and uh, hopefully it'll be a blessing to you as well. I'm Jordan, and uh, here's Dr. Farrell. Well, we, uh, this week is called uh, The Mystery of Christmas, and mm-hmm. today's uh, lesson is The Prince of Peace. So let's get right into it. Ephesians 2, 12-16. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no peace, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now the Lord Jesus Christ did not inherit a kingdom. He was born a king, Mm -hmm. king of the Jews. But in order to make peace, two opposing factions must agree. And obviously there must be a mediator or a prince must be found. And so that's what the Bible says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and a government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So in a world of hatred, gang warfare, terrorism, we need peace. In the world's religions, I think they even make matters worse, if you ask me. The UN, what a joke. The World Council of Churches is a joke. And we need to remember that this warmongering world crucified the Prince of Peace. So it shouldn't surprise us if we have wars and rumors of wars. So first of all, let's take uh, just a little bit of a, um, a cerebral beginning here. Let's start with the demands of a holy God. Now, God is so holy that he cannot lie. He cannot sin or do anything less than the best, the most holy. He cannot tolerate sin. He cannot look upon sin with indifference. He cannot allow one sin to go unpunished. The Ten Commandments reflect and reveal the holiness of God. So God demands perfection in your mouth, your tongue, your mind, your deed, and of course even in your motives. That's why the Bible says, uh, James 2, 10, 11, that if you break one law, then you've violated all ten. God is a God that will not tolerate sin. He will not tolerate compromise. He has perfect demands. God does not see one who understands or seeks or one who does good. The Bible says that in Psalm 53, verse 1 through 3. He looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there was any that did understand or did good or did seek after God. He said there was none. None. So, so much for God looking in the future and seeing who would repent and who would believe. So, first of all, this is the demands of a holy God. Number two, the delusions of vile men. Now, we're born sinners. The longer we live, the more we sin. I mean, it just it's an incurable disease. We are born egocentric and depraved in every faculty of our being. Moral restraints of society and religion will not correct the problem. An act of conscience will not correct the problem. Caring and, um, for others and having them moralistic parents, will, well, it's not going to fix it. And the fear of the law will not fix it. And the fear of the future, even though that's helpful, it does curtail and curb uh, wickedness. But the fear of future retribution can restrain outward sinful indulgences, but never really correct the inward problem. So man is a sinner. The Bible says, He is an incurable sinner for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. And the law or religion cannot justify one sinner. There's no way. Can you get uh, Romans 3, verse 20 and 21 and 22? I'm going to get Romans 10 and verse 1 through 4. But Romans 3, 20, 21, 22. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Mm-hmm. For by the law is, is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. And there is no difference. And then verse 23. 
for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's right. And Romans 10, 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they be an ignorant of God's righteousness, Paul says, and going about to establish their own righteousness, which is self-righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe it. And so see, the delusions of a vile man thinking that because he's religious, he's circumcised, or he prays to Allah, that you can somehow make yourself righteous. That's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's, just, it's, just, it's ridiculous, man. All right, number three, the deliverance of a glorious gospel. Now, God sought for a man to stand the gap, to make intercession, and he found none. And the Bible says his own arm brought salvation. Salvation is holy by design, the work and grace of God. Now, can we get saved by works? Yeah, as long as it's Christ works. If Christ does the work, yeah, then the works will save you. But it's not your work, you see. Mankind was hopelessly lost, but God had a predestinated plan. All right, Galatians 4.4 4 and 5. I'm going to get Romans 5, 6 through 11. Now listen to Romans 5, verse 6 through 11. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. All right, Galatians 4.5, 4.4 uh, 4, 4 and 5. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Hmm. And then Ephesians 2 is where we started. Ephesians 2 and verse 12, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now listen, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Do you see that? It's amazing. It's amazing that God would sacrifice his only begotten son for sinners. That's amazing. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. No wonder the angels broke out in that first Noel, you know? Now, I'm going to tell you a story. I don't know if you've heard the story. If you haven't, you're going to enjoy it. Don Richardson and his wife, Carol, surrendered to be missionaries in the Netherlands province in Papua New Guinea to reach the headhunting tribes of the cannibals called the Sawi. Right, if I'm saying that right, if I'm not, you don't know any different. All right. Now, months rolled into years as they were trying to learn the language and the customs, and they had no name for God in their language. And the etymology of their language and words, there was no word for God. And no concept of a lamb sacrifice, only pigs, no lambs. So to the warring tribe, the, Kam- the uh, Kimur, or Kamur, and the Hanam tribes, killing and eating your enemy was an honor. So you're... You're a hero if you kill your enemy and eat him, according to their culture. The white Tuan missionary, that's what they called him, Tuan, gained trust as a leader and a teacher, so he told the story of Jesus, Jesus being betrayed by Judas and later crucified. But here's the problem. The Khmer tribe, when they heard the story of Judas betraying Jesus and killing him, Judas became the hero. Because he was the tu, the Tui or tu, Tua Asanai man, which means to fatten him with friendship for an unsuspected slaughter. In other words, when he explained the story, he thought, now they'll understand it. No, no, no. Judas was a hero because he got his enemy to believe a lie and he tricked him and betrayed him. And then, of course, he died. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, this was practiced often with hogs and men cannibalism. So Judas was viewed as a hero. He deceived and destroyed Jesus. Well, Richardson, the missionary, was disgusted. How can I explain the gospel to them? Their their culture is so convoluted, I don't see a way to get the gospel. So he just kept working with them. Weeks later, the Kamur tribe and the Hanam tribe were about to face off war. Well, they're coming to to a head. The headdresses were plumed and their spears and their bows were polished and made ready. Just then, Kayo 
who only had one son, went and took his infant son, Biakadon, and ran to meet the opening tribe with his wife, Wumi. Frantically weeping, other men, the Mahanan and uh, Sinon, or Sinon, had several sons. And Kaio met the Hanim tribe, and he cried out for Mehor. Mehor, will you plead the word the words of Kamur among your people. Mehor, I will plead the words of Kamur among my people. Then I will give you my son and with him my name. And they all yelled, Eha, Eha, Eha. That means it's enough. It's enough. Now follow the story. Here's the leader of this tribe trying to avert war. In order to avert war, he uh, appealed to them and said, I'll give you my son. Then appeared Mahor, was now named Kayo, and gave Kayo one of his baby sons, and in some fashion adopted Mahanan's name. So, Richardson's watching all this, and he thought, infant sacrifice? What in the world is this? And they called him, this is interesting, the Eni Tim Ken Kaninai Arkivi Damaki Yasini Asimidin. I know, I'm not saying it right. Here's what that means. Those who accept this child as a basis for peace, come and lay your hands on him. And so they called this little baby Tarap Tim, and it means peace child. In other words, this child becomes like the mediator gift, and they're going to lay hands on him called the peace child. When questioned by missionary Richardson, Kayo said this, Tuhan, you have urged us to have peace. Don't you know it is impossible to have peace without the Tarap Tim peace child? You can't have peace. Both children are protected. If one dies, the other tribe is not bound by the peace oath. The peace depends on the continued life of the peace child. Richardson showed them that Jesus Christ is the eternal peace child. Eventually, the majority of the Sawi people, several tribes, were converted to Jesus Christ because he was able to crack that culture. And they stopped killing and headhunting and cannibalism. And, as the story goes, years later, Judas, in the story of Jesus Christ, became the villain because he betrayed the peace child. So, see, really, Christmas is about Christ. He's the peace child. He's the Tarap Tim, the peace child that will never die. See, that's what's so cool about our Lord and Savior. Yes, he did die on the cross, but he'll never die again. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of our program here And It's Not Over with Dr. Dan Farrell. We ask that you please come back, check out these channels or Facebook um, or our YouTube uh, uh, channel there and also on sermonaudio.com slash it's not over. Um, they're only 15 minutes long, so they're kind of convenient for the listener, especially if you have a short commute to work. Um, I do think that there is a uh, sermon audio app that you can download to your phone. If you have a smartphone, you can download that and then listen and on your car rides, all right? And there are also many other tools in which you can use uh, in that manner. If you do check out one thing uh, via the internet, please check out our website, and that is morningstarnetwork.org. Check that out. Tell your friends about it. Tell your family. Um, and you also, you can give financially. Send us a Christmas gift, a financial Christmas gift this year, maybe. And it's tax deductible, by the way. Um, and uh, we would really receive a blessing from that. And what we use with that money is we will use it to promote this this program on YouTube and on Sermon Audio. And so we thank you so much for being an avid listener. We hope you have a wonderful time over Christmas and over the New Year's. We wish you the best. Here's Dr. Farrell to close. We do wish you a Merry Christmas. But what I mean by that is, will you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? He said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The kind of peace that the Lord Jesus Christ can give you is the peace that will never go away. I beg you, please repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ.